We're here today on August 5th, 1993, with Colonel Al Fletcher Prouty, Air Force retired, to discuss various incidents in history that were so formative in post-World War II U.S. history, politics, power, and to look at things in more detail than is commonly done throughout the media in this day and age. One thing that I've always felt you provide a great deal of solid information on that is never discussed is the whole formative event of the Kennedy administration, which is the Bay of Pigs. And citing the letter to the president that was written by the four people that he convened to study what went wrong with the Bay of Pigs, there's a great deal in that committee the testimony that they heard from people, the way they operated, that is never talked about, that is crucial, it seems, to understanding how Kennedy got his sea legs, so to speak, when he became president in seeing how things weren't working right with the failure of this operation. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have you tell us some about, perhaps start with this final report that was never found for years because people were asking the wrong questions that indicates the perceptiveness of the president in trying to understand what had really happened so that it wouldn't happen again. You know, it's, a, it's an awfully good approach to the problem because very few people have studied the Kennedy period before his death or even have known much about Kennedy before he was elected president. You know, he came right out of World War II with a busy career during the war as a naval officer. He was elected a congressman from Massachusetts, served as a congressman. He stayed here in Washington, served as a senator from Massachusetts, and then was elected president. There are very few men arriving at the office of president who have more background in Washington than Kennedy had. He was younger than most of them, but he had more background experience which means he knew the bad things as well as the good things. There were a lot of things that he was against in the way the government had been going under the Eisenhower and post-war administration, and he wanted to use the presidential power to change them. And one of the first things that he found that he had to take care of, there were two things, was the Bay of Pigs. Now, that was an Eisenhower program. That was approved by the Eisenhower National Security Council, uh, in uh, March of 1960. Uh, about May of 1960, the CIA people came to my office because it was my job in the Pentagon to provide the support of CIA's clandestine operations. That was my job. I had been in that job for years. And they wanted to have the military open a base where they could train these exile Cubans who were perfectly willing to try to get back into Cuba and incite enough rebellion to throw Castro out. Because that's what the original Eisenhower approval was, to try to get proven uh, Cuban support for the plan. Eisenhower would never have, have approved an invasion. He never did. Eisenhower knew too much about invasions to, to have that happen. Well, you follow that through now from the mid '60s. And then you have this important event when Kennedy and Nixon had the TV debates before the, just before the election. And everybody felt that the two were just inseparable. There was no way to tell who was going to be elected president. And they came to debate number four, and Kennedy pressed the Cuban issue, the Castro issue, because Nixon had made so much of it, you know, that the government, we would overthrow Castro, we've got to get rid of Castro, he's a communist and all that sort of thing. And Kennedy, who knew as much or more about the program than even Nixon did, uh, whipped Nixon in the debate. And let me tell you just a little personal incident uh, as a part of my official duties, but it lets you see the validity of this. I was asked to go to the Senate office building to a certain room number 
and to pick up four men and bring them back to the office of the Secretary of Defense. That's where I was working. I was working with the Office of the Secretary of Defense. The four men I picked up were the leaders of the Cuban program, Artima and Mendonca and Deverona and uh, those people. And they knew Kennedy. They were in the, sent the number of the office room I was sent to was Kennedy's office. So here's Kennedy with these Cubans talking with them in August of 1960. He had just been won the, the Democratic nomination to run for president. He knew this background. And uh, furthermore, I understand that the Cubans had visited him in his home in Palm Beach. He knew these people. He knew everything that was going on. Well, Nixon didn't know he knew that. So in the debate, when it came time to argue with Nixon about it, Kennedy cleaned up on that debate, and a lot of people believe that's how he won the election, a very narrow election, but he won. Days after that debate, the CIA came to us in the Pentagon <clears throat> talking about an invasion of Cuba. That was not the approved plan. Kennedy was not president yet. We knew Eisenhower wouldn't talk about that. The CIA did it. They put pressure on Kennedy themselves. And what had been a plan to drop 30 men groups from an airplane, a C-46 can carry about 30 with their equipment, or over the beach program from submarines or fast boats, 20 or 30 men, all of a sudden they're talking about 3,000 men, training the 3,000. Uh, I had to send men to uh, uh, Guatemala to train pilots. I had to get aircraft reconfigured in Arizona so to be used for that purpose. We got Filipino experienced men that General Lansdale knew that it helped him during the time when he was in the overthrow of Quirino in uh, uh, the Philippines, which is much like the Castro thing. So the Filipino experience was valuable. People don't realize how big the, the Cuban program was. The ships had arms and equipment on board enough for 25,000 fighters not just the 1,500 that went on the beach. You see, all of this developed in the working arrangements that were being made from day to day to support this operation. But the strange thing was how it accelerated right after the election. Mm -hmm. They were going to press Kennedy to accept the invasion because during the time before his inaugural, they got all of this change started and in being. So that by the time of the invasion, Actually, the ships were at sea from different areas already heading for Cuba, and Kennedy had not approved the program. So, you see, that is so different from what most people have heard about the way the thing was organized. One thing that the agency had done at the suggestion of the JCS was to bring in a most competent Marine colonel who knew invasion tactics to work out the invasion plan. The JCS had told the CIA that if Castro's combat aircraft were not destroyed before the men hit the beach, there was no chance that they could get on because the combat aircraft were being on home ground and all, and the men just on the beach with no protection couldn't protect themselves. They must destroy the aircraft totally before the men hit the beach. That was a, a fundament of the whole plan. The Marine Colonel knew it, and the JCS had told the CIA that. Well. It finally came down to where, after several meetings with the president, during which he would not approve the program, finally, in the middle of April of 1961, Mr. Dulles told him that, well, we have got to do something. We've been training these men now for a year. They think they're going to be brought into their home, and they think we're going to help them gain their country back again. And incidentally, the ships with the men on board are at sea, rendezvousing around the Vieques Island area. We must get an approval to go. Is there anything else to keep it from on? Kennedy waited for the strike on the airfields of Cuba until Saturday morning. They destroyed seven of Castro's ten combat capable aircraft. They didn't have to bother with the transports and all. They went after the bombers and the fighters. They destroyed seven of them. Unfortunately, three jets had taken off from where they had been the day before when we had pictures of them and gone down to Santiago for the weekend and they weren't there and they weren't destroyed. So on Sunday when they went to brief the president they told him, they showed him pictures, they had destroyed seven planes but three were left they had to get those three airplanes before the men hit the beach uh, at Zapata Landing. 
Well, Kennedy ordered specifically, it was about sometime about mid-afternoon, three o'clock in the afternoon, he ordered the first thing to be the destruction of those aircraft. That was a Kennedy order. A very close friend of mine was in command of the bomber base in Puerto Cabezas, Nicaragua, that was to do the job. Four B-26s were to be dispatched about one o'clock, and it's very important because they had to hit the planes before the dawn landing of the men on the beach, or the landing, would they'd then be in the air supporting the beach, and they were so superior to the bombers that they shoot the bombers down one after the other. Everybody understood that, we thought. <coughs> so Kennedy ordered that, and as a prerequisite to the landing. He agreed to the landing on Monday morning, April 18th, 1961. Now, when there was a study of what happened, Kennedy put together the Cuban study group to find out what went wrong. Here is an old mimeograph copy from my days in the Pentagon of the report of this study group. It wasn't seen by anyone or very few people for at least 20 years when it began to pop up in books that people knew about it. And then finally, in 1981, this book was published for academic purposes, for university use, a book called Zapata, which is every word that's in here, just an just a absolute uh, copy of this. But this is the old original. I want you to see what it looked like in the beginning. <laughs> And when the Cuban study group questioned the people that came before it as to what happened and why didn't we succeed with the Bay of Pigs program, they ran into a most interesting situation because, first of all, Kennedy and his advisors were very adept at this organization. They really did a good job. Can you imagine a committee better than this one, to study the Bay of Pigs. Alan Dulles was on that study group. Admiral Burke was on the study group. Admiral Burke was a CNO of the Navy, member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he was the one who had been designated to support the operation of the Bay of Pigs landings. Now, he knew more about it than anybody else. He was sitting in the room, no matter who came in, Admiral Burke, old Arley Burke, knew what was going on. And I've talked to him many times since then about this, and he did know. Another man, with General Maxwell Taylor. Maxwell Taylor and Kennedy had never met, but Kennedy knew Maxwell Taylor's reputation, and he knew that he was a good, solid man for this kind of investigation. So he put Maxwell Taylor as the chairman of the group. But there was a fourth man, and as my friends would tell me when they'd come back from the hearing, I knew almost all the guys that went in there. They come, my office was only about two doors down from where the committee was meeting in the Pentagon. They'd come back and they'd say, you know, those three guys are pretty tough, but it's that little son of a gun on that straight back chair in the corner that's really watching it with beady eye. doesn't say anything. Well, that's Bobby Kennedy. Can you imagine? Bobby Kennedy, Maxwell Taylor, Arlie Burke, and Alan Dulles to study what went wrong with the Bay of Pigs. Now, they were even sharper than that because by that time, Maxwell Taylor and my boss, General Lemnitzer, and Arlie Burke, had made up their mind that this was the last time that the CIA was going to get into a major operation. They weren't the right people to be running military type operations. So they brought in other competent people to provide them with information that they would provide to Kennedy in this report. And one of the best things they did, one of the people they brought in that was really important was General Walter Beetle Smith. Now, uh, people who remember World War II will remember that he was the chief of staff for Eisenhower for the invasion of Europe and the whole European operation of World War II. A very competent, experienced, reliable general. And at the, immediately at the end of World War II, Waterbill Smith had been sent to Moscow as the American ambassador to the Soviet Union. Well, of course, they were our partners through the war. It was a very friendly relationship. Uh, Smith was highly regarded by the Soviets as a general that had helped them defeat Hitler and his German troops. So it was a great assignment for Smith. He learned a hell of a lot from that. And so what did he do? 
from Moscow, he was assigned to the new Central Intelligence Agency. And he became the director of Central Intelligence. A lot of people don't remember that. Under Truman. Under Truman, <clears throat> yes. And as the director of Central Intelligence, all the CIA people knew him very well. They knew that he knew things, they knew he was tough, and that they couldn't get around him. So what did they do in the Zapata program? They bring General Smith in. He didn't have anything to do with the Cuban program, but he was pretty useful because among other things, and this probably tips Kennedy's hand as close as anything I can think of in trying to study what happened. Why was Kennedy killed? What brought up the pressures and the power and the intense feelings against Kennedy that would cause people in power to make the decision to get rid of him? But it begins with this sort of a thing. In response to questions about running something like the Bay of Pigs, Smith said clearly, a democracy cannot wage war. When you go to war, you pass a law giving extraordinary powers to the president. The people of our country assume, when the emergency is over, that the rights and the powers that were temporarily dele delegated to the chief executive will be returned to the states, to the counties, to the people. Pretty fundamental statement from yeah. a major, uh, not I mean a full general, but from a major general, an important man. Right. He went on to say now about Bay of Pigs. I only know what the papers say, but covert operations, and he knew a lot about them, he'd been the DCI, can be done up to a certain size, right. and we've handled some pretty large operations. By that he meant, if it's oh, not more than two or three people, it can't be a secret anymore. In fact, the New York Times had carried front page headlines saying the U.S. government was supporting the exiles <laughs> against Castro. in. March of 1961. It was already all over the papers. He's pointing out that out as a mistake. But then Smith begins to get to the point. He said, I think that so much publicity has been given to CIA that the covert work might have to be put under another roof. I think he was pretty explicit about that. He'd say, it's time we take the bucket of slop and go out and cover over it. Well, what something like that does is put in the president's mind the words from a man that knew everything there was, and from the time he heard that from Walter Beetle Smith by way of his Cuban study group committee, you know he had one thing in his mind, he's going to get through with the CIA in that kind of business. And let me just read you what General Smith uh, excuse me, General Taylor presented to the general when, when that was over. When the Cuban study group had completed its work, right. they had agreed unanimously with their own report. Even though Dulles was on there, it was a unanimous vote. Even though Bobby Kennedy was on it, it was a unanimous vote. It ended up as a letter to the president on the 13th of June, 1961. Their work was done very quickly. And one of the dominant things to come out of it was a paper that President Kennedy signed personally and sent directly to General Lemnitzer, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He didn't send it to the State Department, to Dean Rusk. He didn't even send it to McNamara, which all correspondent ordinarily would go through. And he didn't send a copy to CIA. So you can see that Kennedy was saying to General Lemnitzer, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, this is what I want done. Now, in the procedures of how you do these things in the Joint Staff, where everything is very formal, it just happened that I was the officer that the director of the Joint Staff gave this paper to from the White House and said, prepare a briefing for the chiefs. And I did, so I'm very familiar with it. And just, I'll only read a paragraph, but you don't have to read more. The President informed the Joint Chiefs of Staff that the President regards the Joint Chiefs of Staff as his principal military advisor, responsible both for initiating advice to him and responding to requests for advice. 
He expects their advice to come to him direct and unfiltered. And that the Joint Chiefs of Staff have a similar responsibility for the defense of the nation in a Cold War as they have in conventional hostilities. Now, in the terminology of the government, to say that the Joint Chiefs of Staff have that responsibility in the Cold War, he's saying the CIA will no longer have that responsibility. You see? That was a stroke of the pen that was as powerful as a thunderclap. Hmm. And when I read that to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you could have heard a pin drop. Hmm. And I was told, Colonel Prouty, take that back to the files. When we need it, we'll call you. You know what that meant? They were going to wait until the situation had been completely prepared for this next step forward because that's a major change. They understood can, the implications. Yes. They realized how can the military in uniform go into covert operations? I mean, the, the ridiculous POW MIA situation that we have now is a result of that. Fifteen years of the Vietnam War, everybody that went to Vietnam was under the command, operational control of a CIA man. Well, then how can he be a prisoner of war? He's a spy. And that's what the enemy thought. They didn't give a darn about all the fine print. Right. So you see, the chiefs of staff knew that. So for the next few years, Kennedy studied this situation and prepared the ground for a report. But this is why I feel that the key, the beginning point in the troubles that Kennedy had with many points of power began with this situation because he signaled clearly with the assistance of General Smith and the others that he was putting the CIA out of the business and turning them back to intelligence only. And of course, the law that created CIA never gave him this authority in the first place. So he was right and he knew that law. That's why I say the Bay of Pigs is the key to the problems that came later. One other thing in that is the question of the miscommunications apparently that occurred come Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening that seems to have centered around George Bundy, his yes, special assistant. There is a common misunderstanding about that business. Among the people call before this Cuban study group, the four men that I mentioned to you, was the uh, advisor to the president, Mr. McGeorge Bundy. And he, I believe, visited them three times and they also accepted written material from him. It was a pretty thorough uh, contact between the committee and Mr. Bundy. And then in their conclusions, which anybody can read, they pointed out that it was their opinion that the most significant reason for the failure of the Bay of Pigs was the fact that this airstrike that Kennedy had ordered on that Sunday afternoon, the day before the landing, was canceled. And in pursuing how that happened, they found out that at 9.30 on Sunday night, McGeorge Bundy had called General Cavill who was responsible for the CIA at that time, because of all weekends, Alan Dulles was out of the country. Here he's in charge of the whole thing, and Alan Dulles was out of the country. But anyway, General Cavill, perfectly competent person, was called by McGeorge Bundy and told not to fly the airplanes that night until they could operate them the next day off the beach at the Zapata landing site, which destroyed the whole operation. If, if, if McGeorge Bundy had had a little more military experience, perhaps, or if General Cavill had had just a little more, uh, you know, th thought about it more, they'd have realized that they absolutely destroyed the Bay of Pigs there because if they didn't destroy those last three aircraft, they were going to lose. And those three aircraft, the first thing in the morning, sank the t two supply ships so that the men on the beach had no ammunition, their food was gone, their radios were gone, their trucks were gone, everything. Just those little airplanes did it. And during the period that the men were on the beach, they destroyed 16 B-26s. In other words, just raised havoc with the whole operation. So it's obvious the study group, when, when Maxwell Taylor wrote his letter to the president, he said, our conclusion is that the principal reason for the failure was the failure 
to carry out the mission that the President had ordered to destroy those last three planes. Why did Bundy give that call? There have been a lot of collateral points. The paper I've read to you does not elaborate on why he did it. But with Bobby Kennedy in the room, you know very well that Bundy couldn't say such other things as, oh, the president told me to do it, because Bobby would have known that wasn't true. Right. So he couldn't say that. And perhaps Bundy's uh, inexperience in military matters, I don't know, I couldn't make an excuse. All I know is he called Cabell and said, don't fly it. And that's on the record. I, d I don't say that. I read it from the record. Because mm -hmm. there's that other uh, place that we put the yellow post-it in there that was the actual base conclusion of their sense of why it had failed, which is never talked about. This, this is never articulated anywhere in newspapers or anything if the Bay of Pigs is ever discussed. Yeah. Now, you know, that's a problem, too, because there are many books written about the Bay of Pigs. And some of them were written after 1981, when Zapata had been released. Up to that time, this kind of thing was not available. Right. I had it, but I don't know anybody else that had it. But so that they have never quoted the exact words. And to be sure that we understand exactly what the study group found, I will read you the words that they sent to the president. It's item 43 in their report, and it simply says, at about 9.30 p.m., on 16 April, that was that Sunday Funny. when Kennedy directed the attack, Mr. McGeorge Bundy, special assistant to the president, telephoned General C.P. Cabell, who was the deputy director of CIA and had a long time experience with CIA, to inform him that the dawn airstrikes the following morning should not be launched until they could be conducted from a strip within the beachhead. Now, you see, there was a strip within the beachhead, but you can't, you can't destroy the airplanes after they've already destroyed your, your landing. I mean, it's backwards. Right. And this hit the committee. I mean, this is the thing they said, this is our finding as the, the basic reason for the failure of the Bay of Pigs. And when they interviewed Cubans down through here in the back, when they talked to these poor Cubans that were involved, each of the Cubans, one after the other, says, the problem was we didn't have the aircraft that, to, to destroy those last three. Right. And of course, uh, certain propagandists or <clears throat> whatever you want, revisionists, want to say that the problem was that Kennedy denied the air cover. Right. There was no air cover in the plan because the plan was written and approved by the JCS to destroy all of, Ken all of Castro's aircraft first. Right. You don't need air cover if they have no planes, see? The plan was built on that idea. And people say that he should have provided the air cover. There is a National Security Council directive, which is a superior document to everything we have in the executive department, that was produced and signed in Eisenhower's time in March of 19. Uh, 54, 54, been in effect for a long time, <clears throat> called NSC Directive Number 5412. And that directive prohibits the use of uniform services in covert operations. Prohibits it. Our government knew that during Eisenhower's time, and of course Kennedy knew that during his time. That precluded the use of military in a clandestine operation. And that's the kind of thing that General Smith was referring to. You can't, you can't mix the two. You can't put the military in covert operations. And uh, we're having trouble with that today. Is our operation in, uh, in um, Somalia, is that considered maybe a, a covert operation or is it a military operation? How are we running? Are the people that are flying the airplanes considered military or are they considered some kind? We don't have a place in the middle of those this is what the government's trying to work out at the present time. What is the role of the military? Even in the Vietnam War for 15 years, the military that were used before 1965, and you know it started in 1945, the first American was killed in Vietnam in September 45. For those 20 years, all activity was covert. It was under the CIA. So that's what we're going back to the program here. And Kennedy knew that it was against the government policy 
to use uh, military active duty air crews in such a landing as a covert operation because it immediately would reveal the hand of the US government in an operation against a sovereign country and that's not permitted so the people that throw the idea of Kennedy's failure to provide air cover are, are just unaware of the situation that existed legally uh, in practice and in the way you use military in this country. We, we agree with those laws and international agreements and we don't do it the other way. You see, that's a good way to link the two together because historically these two things ran together. They, they, were, they were essentially the same thing. They were major CIA operations that the generals knew were too big to even be thought of as covert operations. You know, the CIA assisted a rebellion in Indonesia in 1958 in which at one time I myself ordered the delivery of 42,000 rifles. I mean, that's not a covert operation, you see. We were using submarines against the south coast of the islands of Indonesia, not a covert operation. So the military looked very carefully at these things and knew that the CIA was going much too far. We supported the Kamba people in Tibet, something like 60 or 70,000 of them by dropping arms to them, medicine, weapons, everything. Uh, to those people. That's not covert, but we thought it was. You know, we put it under the rules of CIA's operation. And this is what Kennedy was facing during that transition from the Eisenhower time when the CIA had begun to get into all these things. The Indonesian rebellion, the, the Tibetan program, the Cuban program, all were in that period of time, and Kennedy inherited that. And at the same time, the general, General Ridgway, who died just a week or two ago, told Kennedy clearly, don't ever let Americans come into Asia. That's, don't ever bring American soldiers into Asia. And General Bradley, I used to be General Bradley's personal pilot, and I know the gentleman, one of the finest men ever put a uniform on. He gave Kennedy the same answers. Eisenhower, in this book here on the foreign relations of the United States, says how bitterly he opposes uh, the entry of, uh, <clears throat> of of American divisions into Vietnam. If I tab that page, it's very interesting. This, by the way, is the foreign relations of the United States, Vietnam, August to December 1963, zeroing right in on the peak of the time of Kennedy's involvement in the planning for the future in Vietnam. And anybody that wants to think that Kennedy was not deep into the activities in Vietnam doesn't realize that during this period of, of that time, there were meetings going on day after day after day in the White House in which my own boss, General Victor Krulak, was involved, uh, Maxwell Taylor was involved, McNamara was involved, and what that would mean is when they'd come back to the office, the rest of us and the joint staff were involved supporting the president in the development of these plans because he knew that he was either going to have to make the decision, as he did in NSAM 55, right. to get the CIA out of this covert work, and with the CIA out of, say, the operation in Vietnam, he saw no role for the military. Huh. And it was perfectly logical from the Kennedy point of view and from what the Joint Chiefs of Staff had told him that we should not be in Vietnam. And when he wrote this document, which because of our movie, JFK, Oliver Stone's work, where we introduced the subject of the National Security Action Memorandum number 263, right. which was written and signed on October 11th, 1963, saying that we would, that all U.S all American personnel would be out of Vietnam by the end of 65. That was Kennedy's decision after all of this work spanning this period of six months. And here you can read day by day by day the meetings were well. I counted over 50 meetings that are listed in this book 
in which my own boss, General Krulak, attending meetings with President Kennedy on Vietnam. And as Kennedy worked his Vietnam policy out during that period, he arrived at what you might call a scenario. He wanted to be sure everybody understood what he was doing. So he sent General Krulak quickly to Vietnam. The idea being, published in the papers, that he was going to get the last minute word uh, in Vietnam to see how things stood. That was in late August or? Uh, late August, I think he actually traveled in September okay. because I myself was sent to the SYNCPAC headquarters in Hawaii to meet with Admiral right. Felt and I have yet never revealed the reasons for that meeting but the two had a very strong, I was doing a lot of writing for General Krulak and they were very much related. And when General Krulak came back, he met with Kennedy and discussed up to date the things he heard from the people out there, which of course we knew by telephone anyway, but it made the scenario more reasonable. And so immediately Kennedy ordered Maxwell Taylor and McNamara to go to Vietnam. And so they went uh, late in September, I believe it is. After a very busy flying trip going all over the country, talking not only to President Diem but to his opposition, because by that time Diem had some serious operation, uh, opposition in his country, they came back. Well, they had brought a big trip report for the President. Now, it, it, it's, it's absolute fantasy to think that two busy men like General Taylor and Mr. McNamara are going to make a quick flying trip all through Vietnam, transversing the Pacific Ocean and everything, and write a great trip report while they go. <laughs> it would be written right in the Pentagon. But more importantly, it was being written as a result of these meetings, and Kennedy was dictating the policy daily to these people that he met with. His staff in the White House, people from State Department, people from CIA, and the military, and when McNamara and Taylor got back to Hawaii. A jet carrying the report landed in Hawaii and gave it to him, a big document with leather covered, with President John F. Kennedy on the cover and all that sort of thing. They couldn't have possibly have done that while they were traveling. And then they had the time to review the report as they flew back to Washington, usually a eight hour, 45 minute trip in those days in one of the Air Force One aircraft, and they left Andrews Field in a helicopter, they arrived on the White House lawn and presented it to the President, it had just left him about two days earlier, and here was the trip report, that's October 2nd right. of 1963, <clears throat> and that trip report contains the information that Kennedy had approved that he was going to bring a thousand men home by Christmas time, that's a thousand military men, and by the end of 65, the bulk of U.S. personnel. Now, bureaucracy is an interesting thing. We learn what certain words mean. If he had said he would bring home the bulk of American military personnel, you would assume that the military personnel were there. So he bring in America. And most people who write about that period say Kennedy was going to bring home or not bring home. He's going to, they were used the word that we're going to withdraw the soldiers. Well, they weren't going to withdraw them. They weren't there. Withdrawal is not the word. That's wrong. And many people have been writing for The Nation magazine and other magazines like that trying to explain Kennedy's mind overlooked the fact that we very carefully inserted into that document bring home the U.S. personnel. And what did that mean? The CIA people were coming out. So again, that Lord the Boom on the CIA, and this time it was the last time. They were going to be out of covert operation completely. So NSAM 55 began the movement of getting CIA out, and 263 closed the book on it. And by 65, he would have had no CIA people in, in Vietnam at all. And they'd been there since 45. So you see a good long period of time, 20 years. And in other countries too. He would have stopped them from being in covert operations overseas. It's a very fundamental points that if you look in the right books and at the right reports, you get them all and they're all backed up. These are not my words. I happen to be there and I have to be working in them. But this series, especially this latest book that has just been released, gives you the answers to what people have been looking for for years. 
But the trouble is that during this period, countless history books have been written about Kennedy, about Vietnam, about the post-war period, about the Cold War. And the writers have not used this sort of material. And unfortunately, the books are, what will we call them, fantasy or mythology? Concoction. Correct. I belong to the Society of Historians for American Foreign Relations, a wonderful organization of thousands of mostly history professors all throughout the country. And as we have our annual meetings, one of the complaints that arises more frequently than any other is the quality of history books today. Quality meaning, are they true? Are they revisionist? There's more things been written about Kennedy that are absolutely untrue since his death. There's no sense of killing a guy twice, once with a gun and once with a typewriter. And, and they're untrue. And what I think people ought to do is refer to the work of these generals, like this report at the Bay of Pigs, or refer to these works, papers from the State Department. They're listed as the Foreign Relations of the United States and see what the facts are. Or refer to some of the gentlemen that are mentioned in here who are still with us, God bless them, because those are the important things. And that tells us what really happened. And this is why when I worked with Oliver Stone, we were working from this kind of paper, and that's what stirred up so much opposition. Yeah. Because when these big time writers in the New York Times and the Washington Post and other papers said, there is no substantive history to back up what Stone's putting in the film, all they need to do is read these books. There's the substantive history. And it's appalling to think that these men who work every day on the minds of the American public with their computer writing through the New York Times and the Washington Post and the rest of them are telling us that sort of thing when they know very well what they're saying is not true. It's too bad, but it's not true. And as you were saying before, the Taylor McNamara report, which became, in essence, the, the formalized text for 263, you were involved working under Krulak in writing a lot of what became their report that they gave back to Kennedy when they arrived on the White House lawn that was derived from all these meetings. Yes. And, you know, people have to understand, when you, when, when you talk about the Joint Chiefs of Staff, there's an organization called the Joint Staff. Now, in my day, by law, it could not exceed 400 people. And so I was one of 400. And people say, well, what's your job? Our job is to do this kind of thing. When General Krulak would come back, he'd throw notes on the table before five or six of us, or even uh, tape record, cassette recording. And he'd say, there's what we did today. Now, look, each one of you do such and such a part you've been working on and we'll get this report the way the president wants it. Right. And when the president, when it was the way the president wanted it, that's when it went out to Hawaii to Taylor and McNamara so that when it came back, the president was ready to sign it as his policy for Vietnam, which was he was not going to put American troops into Vietnam. Where we put, do you know how many troops were really in Vietnam? 2,600,000. And 58,000 were killed, let alone all the other people that were killed. By the time it was all done? By the time the Vietnam War was over, 2,600,000 men had been rotated through Vietnam. We don't very often think about that. We dropped more bombs from aircraft in Vietnam, <coughs> in Indochina, than all of World War II. People don't have any idea what Vietnam really got to be after the death of Kennedy. Well, in all of those big numbers that I'm talking about, the money that rolled out went at least to $570 billion. Now, if Kennedy had not died, he would not have put those people there, not just the 500,000 that were there at any given day, but the 2,600,000. And if the people didn't go, they would not have had to spend the $570 billion. Well, there were, as, as General Eisenhower said in his great speech, which was the opening of the, of the Stone film, great. that beware of the military-industrial complex. And 
when you threaten such a complex with the potential of 570 billion and then you're going to bring it down to nothing you are bound to get some hot-headed decisions and the removal of the president is not a very difficult thing to do just think of the list of presidents who've been wounded shot at killed since world war ii a lot of people don't know that that even president carter was threatened with assassination and, and president reagan had a bullet in him uh, it, it, it's it's a, a very very different world when we don't use things in a factual basis and really know what's going on because then the public is so badly confused plus in debt <laughs> confused and deeply in debt you know I don't have my book is here I don't know whether I can but in, in the book I, I could show you just to make a point I, because I knew the document, I inserted in, in this book of mine the picture of these men coming back to Washington with this report. It's on the coffee table in the president's office. And if anybody thinks that that huge report could have been written while they were running from one place to another in Vietnam, you see that big report on the coffee table in front of the president and Maxwell Taylor and McNamara there that is the report of the trip they couldn't have done that on the back of envelopes while they were running right. and it was <clears throat> very carefully designed by Kennedy to support his Vietnam policy you right. see I mean, he had no it's like saying he was to blame for not providing air cover for the Cubans here's something people are saying he had no policy for Vietnam. he was going to be the thing that's very interesting about Kennedy's death and this work, <clears throat> there was a meeting convened in Honolulu mm -hmm. on the 20th of November, 1963. Very strange meeting because 60 leaders of our government, including the ambassador from Saigon, among others, and all of Kennedy's cabinet had gone to Honolulu. And they had this meeting about what to do in the future with the Vietnam War. Despite the fact that this existed, there was this meeting about the Vietnam War. The interesting thing is that the report that they released that day, November 20th, and published in the New York Times, among other papers, on the 21st, is a glowing report of how things were becoming better in Vietnam. And yet, on the same day, November 21st, 1963, a report was written called NSAM 273, which was reversing some of the Kennedy policy for Vietnam. And yet, hypothetically, this NSAM, new NSAM, would have to be signed by Kennedy. And yet the Honolulu uh, meeting was providing Kennedy with assurances that everything was going well. So could it be that this NSAM 273 was somehow signaling a change which of course by March of 1973 when NSAM 288 came out under Lyndon Johnson escalated the war to what we saw later. Now you said March of 83, you mean March uh, of 64? No, March of 64. March yes, of 64. Thank you very much. Okay. March of 64. But you can see the changes in it. And some of these people have said, again referring to the Kennedy policy of not putting America, not withdrawing America, but not putting Americans in. Withdrawal was bringing the boys home for Christmas, but the, not putting them in. They completely overlook this rapid change that came right about the time the president was killed and to me it just underscores terrifically <laughs> the way history books are, are worked on. Right. In 1967, sort of summing up all of this Vietnam period, 
Secretary McNamara of the Defense Department ordered a group to write the history of the U.S. in Vietnam from 1945, notice the date he picks, 45, to the present. And the present would be when they got it done, the end of 1968. So, rather in a chronological manner, they wrote what amount to being five volumes this size of this history of the United States, a history written by people in the Pentagon, paid for by the U.S. government, and published by the U.S. government. It's called the Pentagon Papers. It, that, 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 what, because it is the same stack of highly classified papers that Daniel Ellsberg released to the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, and a few other papers and of course Ellsberg got in serious trouble for violating security and releasing this, which of course was very good advertising for this. Because this was put together, as it states clearly in the opening paragraphs, by a man named Les Gelb. Gelb was working in the inter internal security off agency offices of the office of the Secretary of Defense. Okay. That's where he was working. It also just happens that if you look in the Pentagon telephone books of the period, you find that not only is Mr. Gelb listed in ISA, but Daniel Ellsberg is listed in the Pentagon telephone books. And anybody that has enough interest to want to read history should just look in these books because a lot of other nice names in here. <laughs> General Richard Secord was working in the same office. Mr. Eagleburger, the State Department, was working in the same office. ISA. ISA. Bill Bundy was working. He's the head. Bill Bundy was the head of it for a while. ISA. They had little robin's nests there that was bringing out all these things. But something that I want to emphasize on this business of history, because most history professors, and therefore, unfortunately, most history students, believe that the Pentagon Papers are the essence of the Vietnam War period, and that if they study these, they know what went on. And the book is written in chronology, like the page I'm open to here has the 3rd of November, the 4th of November, and over here on this page, 9th of November, the 20th of November, the Honolulu Conference, the conference I was talking to you about, <coughs> with all the people out there. <coughs> the entire country team met with Rusk, McNamara, Taylor, Bundy, Bell, and so I have a letter, copy of a letter Bundy wrote in 1991, this is McGeorge Bundy, saying he wasn't there. Here he listed, maybe the history book's wrong. But it's real interesting, they write up to the 20th. <coughs> Then on the 22nd of November, 1963, on a blank slate in the, in the Pentagon, they wrote this, Lodge confers with the President, 22nd of November. Having flown to Washington the day after the conference, Lodge meets with the President and presumably continues the kind of report given in Honolulu. 23 November, 1963, NSAM 273. Okay. Drawing together the results of the Honolulu Conference and Lodge's meeting with the President, NSAM 273 reaffirms the U.S. commitment to defeat the Vietcong in South Vietnam. But what's missing? The men that wrote this wrote it in 1968. They hadn't heard that Kennedy had died. They didn't even know Kennedy was missing. When Lodge confers with the President, they didn't clarify whether he met with Kennedy or Johnson, or neither. This is how history is written today. You see? And such things as that are very powerful in the minds of people in college today who are too young to know the things that I can remember about General Walter Beetle Smith, or General Ridgway, or General Bradley, or Alan Dulles. I've worked in Alan Dulles' home with him. I know what Alan Dulles thinks about various things. I've worked with him in John Foster Della's home. Well, why can't we tell it the way it is? Why can't we tell it truthfully? So on the 22nd of November, according to this five-volume study done by 36 PhDs working with Les Gelb, who was 
been the managing editor of the New York Times, among other things. On the 22nd of November, they didn't even notice that the President of the United States had been shot. And the rest of our history books are just about that good. It's terrible. It's a disaster.